John Fuen was orphaned at an early age, around 11. And as he said one time, he lived as a temple boy for five years without really listening to the Dharma at all. Then when he turned 16, he began to listen. He started thinking about himself. Teachings on karma told him that he must have had some bad karma. Here he was, orphaned, poor. Didn't have much of a schooling. If he was going to find any happiness in life, he was going to have to change his ways. It was that turnaround that got him interested in practicing. Why, when he finally ordained as a monk at age 20, he was really upset that he discovered that after reading the Vinaya that they weren't observing the Vinaya very well where he was staying. They certainly weren't practicing meditation. Which is why he was so happy to find a John Lee when a John Lee came the following year into Chandaburi. At that point, he took to the Dharma like a fish to water. But he wasn't always that way. As the texts say, when the mind untrained is very unpliant, it's very resistant. Like the kind of wood that would snap when you try to bend it. Whereas the trained mind is pliant. When you try to bend it in the right direction, it'll go that direction. The problem is, you have to train your mind. It's the mind training the mind. So how does it go from being totally unpliant to being pliant? Well, John Fung's story gives an illustration. You have to see that you've been foolish, that you've been unskillful, that you're suffering. And then you're maybe willing to change, maybe you're willing to listen to the Dharma. One of the ironies of how Buddhism has come to the West is if you are introduced to Buddhism in college, take a course either in Buddhism itself or in comparative religion, one of the first things they tell you is the Four Noble Truths. Whereas when the Buddha was teaching the Four Noble Truths, he was very careful about how he would introduce them. You don't just start out with those truths. There are a few cases where he did, as with the Five Brethren, but their minds were already inclined in a direction away from sensuality. Most people, as the Buddha found, see sensuality as their only escape from pain. And as the Four Noble Truths point out that our cravings for sensuality is one of the reasons why we're suffering, and that clinging to sensuality is suffering in and of itself, it goes against the grain. So how do you change the grain of a person's mind? The Buddha would usually give what's called a graduated discourse, or a step-by-step -step discourse. Anupubhikata is the Pali. And we're told many times in the canon that that was the kind of discourse he would give before introducing the Four Noble Truths. We don't have the text of any of those discourses. It may have been that the Buddha tailored each discourse to the needs of the person who was going to hear it. One of the cases is the householder Upali who had been a strong supporter of the Jains, and had gone one day to argue with the Buddha, thinking that he would bring greater glory to his Jain teacher by showing that even a lay disciple of a Jain teacher could defeat the Buddha. He ends up getting converted. So as the Buddha taught him the step-by-step -step discourse, you can imagine one way in which he would have taught it. There's another case where there was a leper, Subhabhuta. One day he's going through the city, and he sees a large group of people gathered. He thinks, well, maybe there's a food distribution, maybe I can get some food there. And as he gets closer, he realizes no food distribution as a group of people have come to listen to the Buddha, teach the Dharma. So he says, well, I might as well listen to the Dharma myself. And as the Buddha surveys the crowd, he sees that the leper is the one who's going to be able to benefit from the teaching. So he gives a graduated discourse for him. Which you can imagine would be somewhat different, even though the main outlines were the same, it would be different in the details from what he taught Ubali. And of course there are the cases of the cases of the 
archers who were sent to kill the Buddha, and then to kill the archer who had killed the Buddha, and then to kill those archers, and then to kill those archers. He taught them the graduated discourse. They all gained the Dharma after their minds were ready to hear the Four Noble Truths. So there probably were a lot of variations in the details. The general outline is this. He would start with the talk on generosity. And the good comes from generosity. The fact that people respect you, people love you, you have a sense of self-confidence. And he would talk about virtue. Similarly, people would respect you. He said the wealth that comes from being virtuous tends to be solid. In other words, it doesn't fly in, but it doesn't fly out. And again, when you go to a, a meeting of the, your fellow citizens, you're not abashed. You're not afraid that somebody's going to accuse you of a breach of the virtue because you don't have any breaches of virtue. We saw that people were amenable to hearing about what was good about generosity, what was good about virtue. Then he would talk about the pleasures of heaven. And here it's interesting. In the canon, there are a lot of suttas on generosity. There are a lot of suttas on virtue. There's almost nothing on heaven. There are two big suttas on hell. But about the pleasures of heaven, the Buddha simply says, take the pleasures of a king who is loved by a subject who doesn't have to engage in war, rules over a wealthy kingdom, enjoys his wealth, and multiply that many times. That's heaven. Now, one of the reasons the Buddha may be talking about these topics is he's going to be pointing out the drawbacks of sensuality, but first he wants people to see that, yes, he does appreciate the fact that there are pleasures in the sensual realm, the pleasures that come from goodness. So it's not that like he's denying the fact of the pleasures, but as he says, it's because of the pleasures of form, feeling, perceptions, fabrication, and consciousness that we're stuck on them. That's the problem. But still, he wants people to have a sense that, yes, he does appreciate that there are pleasures in life. And when he gets that far, then he turns the tables, then he starts talking about the drawbacks of sensuality, even heavenly sensual pleasures. To begin with, they're not going to last forever. They're going to end. And when you've been used to food appearing when you want it to appear, and whatever pleasure you want appearing when you want it to appear, and then you fall from there, and you find that pleasure is hard to find. It's a sharp fall. You also think about the mental qualities that were developed through virtue and generosity. And then they begin to get eaten away by the fact that everything is so easy for the devas. And they get so complacent. And that's the problem. The very rewards for generosity and virtue eat away the goodness that you developed. And you're back where you started, sometimes worse than where you started. At that point, then, the Buddha would see if you were ready to see renunciation as rest, renunciation as a good thing. This comes on saying that the dangers of complacency. And this is how heedfulness arises. You realize that you've been complacent all along, and you've suffered for it. How much longer do you want to suffer? It's sensing that suffering. That's what makes someone begin to become a little bit pliant and willing to develop heedfulness. Heedfulness, of course, is the basis for the, the five strengths. And the first of the five strengths is conviction. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about how conviction arises out of suffering. And it's precisely in this way. You see that you've been suffering. And you realize it's because of your own actions. You can't blame other people. You were the one who fell for the pleasures that made you complacent. 
So you begin to realize, okay, there's something you've got to do. This is how you develop conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Maybe this is the way out. Again, conviction is not necessarily 100% sure. There's a maybe built in, but it's a maybe of a possibility. You're at least willing to listen to the Buddha's teachings, especially on the power of your actions. And you're willing to take them on as a working hypothesis. That's when you're ready for the Four Noble Truths. Because what you've done is you think about your sensual pleasures and the mind's quality of what they call sensuality, which is its fascination for planning for sensual pleasures, fantasizing about them. And stepping back and saying, maybe that is the problem. The mind really resists, but when there's, you have a sense of your own foolishness, the suffering that you've gone through because of your foolishness, that's when you're willing to step back. And that's what helps develop a noble attitude. When the Buddha calls the noble truth noble, there have been people who've Complain, well, what's noble about suffering? What's noble about craving? The suffering and the craving themselves are not noble. What's noble is the attitude the Buddha has you take. We see all oh, the clinging that is the suffering. That's a problem. Because we usually don't see our clinging as a problem at all. That's what we like to do. We're expert clingers. The same with craving. As Buddha said, everywhere we go, we go with craving as our friend. It whispers into our ear, and whatever it says, we tend to believe it. And I step back and say, wait a minute, the things that I like because of my craving and clinging, the things that I hold on to most dearly, maybe I would have to learn how to let go of them. That attitude is noble, and that's what's noble about those two noble truths. The same with the truth of the path. So I can't blame anyone else for my complacency. I was the one who fell for these things to begin with. I've got to do something about it. That's why the path is noble. You take responsibility for your own suffering, and you take responsibility for putting an end to it. We think about that question that would have said, results from suffering, results from pain, even for little children. Who knows a way to bring about the end of the suffering? Now the question itself is not too picky about the way. We probably hope that someone will just come and take it away for us. Like when you go running to your mother with a cut in your finger and she blows on it to make the pain go away. That's the kind of thing we look for all too often. Somebody will do the work for us. Finally, though, we're beginning to realize, okay, we've got to do the work ourselves because we're the ones who were foolish enough to create the problem to begin with. That's why the path is noble. And of course, it's noble in the sense that it leads beyond just putting it into particular pains, but it takes you to a dimension where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no stress anymore. That's when the mind is really pliant, when it's ready for that solution. But it's in the graduated discourse that makes the mind pliant to begin with. Now, there were cases where the Buddha may have started out in a graduated discourse and found he could take his listeners only so far. That's why we have the talks about generosity, and they just stop with generosity, or the talks on virtue, and they stop with virtue. There were people who had trouble getting their heads even around the fact that virtue and generosity could be good. Those are the minds that were really stiff. The Buddha would plant a seed. Maybe someday they would be able to look at themselves and see, well, maybe there's something wrong in what they've done, and they could have listened to the Buddha and it could have benefited. But if you're wise, you'll follow that line of thought in the graduated discourse all the way through until your mind is ready for the Four Noble Truths, as the Buddha said. When you're ready to see that renunciation of sensuality would be a good thing, then this is if your 
Mine is like a piece of cloth that's ready for the dye. It's been cleaned, has no stains. They can take the dye easily. You'd be the sort of person who takes just a little bit of the dye and the cloth comes out all splotchy. Try to make your mind pliant enough to listen, pliant enough to follow along. Because we tend to be stiff and proud of our pride. And that's why so many people who claim to be Dharma teachers here in the West but keep on wanting to change the Dharma. There's something about the Dharma they hate. They don't want to be Four Noble Truths. They don't want to even be Truths or Noble even. That attitude goes nowhere. Because here is the Buddha who's put all that effort into finding the way, and he's offering it to us for free. Don't be the sort of person who turns him down. 